Let's look to Romans chapter 1, everybody. Romans chapter 1, verse 14 through 16. Romans chapter 1, 14 through 16. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So Paul says, I owe everybody. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. Everybody say everyone. everyone. That believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, let it penetrate every one of our hearts today. It will not return void, but it shall prosper in that which it is sent today. Bring salvation, healing, uh, infilling of the Holy Ghost today in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. come on, tell your neighbor, I see great things coming your way. It's inevitable. Come on, tell somebody. And then you can be seated. Paul begins in Romans chapter 1, verse 14, he says, I am a debtor. Now today, I count it a privilege of all privileges to preach the gospel. I get around a few preachers and they say, uh, you know, I really don't uh, like to preach. And you know, I say to those guys, do us all a favor and quit preaching. Because I don't know about you, but it is a privilege. I owe God for what he's done for me, and I owe the world. It is not an option to me, but I must preach the gospel. I'm obligated. Good news is for sharing. And when I think about the cross and what Jesus did, he did not go there for his sin. you got to understand, when Jesus went to the cross, we, uh, it was the form of capital punishment of that day. And it was not a, a hanging, and it was not an electrocution, and it was not a lethal injection, but it was crucifixion was the way that they would put people to death. And that man, Jesus, went to that cross different than anybody else. He went to the cross not guilty while everybody else went to the cross guilty. He went there to take my place and he went there to take your place and he went there for my sin and your sin and so because of that I am a, a debtor today. I owe people. I know that he paid a debt he did not owe. He paid my ransom and he uh, went there without sin but the Bible said we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm thankful for what Jesus did for me. And today, do you realize that we have a choice to make? We have a choice. We can either serve him or we can choose not to serve him. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy, I have set before you death and life. And I have set before you blessing and cursing. How many understand we have a choice to make? You can choose uh, death or you can choose life. You can choose that curse or you can choose blessing. And the Bible says in the last days there'll be a falling away. And uh, I see uh, people that used to be red hot on fire for God no longer serving God and have strayed away. I understand that's biblical truth today. But I'm going to say it also gives us another choice. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So you have a choice to make today. Blessing or cursing. Death or life uh, or uh, revival or falling away. I don't know about you but as for me and my house we choose uh, the blessing. We choose life and we choose revival. I believe you have a choice to make today and I believe because of what God has done for you and I, that we are all debtors in this place. We owe the world. We owe. He's done so much for me. I know that I am blessed to be a blessing. I have people come to me and they say, why would you go to a place like Pakistan? Why would you go there? It's dangerous. Why would you go to a Muslim nation? I go there to pay my debt. Many of you know in 2010, 
I was in the earthquake in Haiti that took nearly 300,000 people's lives. Why do you keep drilling water wells in Haiti? And why do you keep doing those things? Because I go there to pay my debt. Uh, this summer I was in Guatemala and we were able to feed in one day over 5,000, present the gospel and go to the prison uh, in uh, uh, also Colombia and uh, Guatemala. I'm there to pay my debt. I owe. Now listen, I was got to explain something. One of the things I really love to do is go to the prison. I don't want to go there overnight, by the way. I don't look that good in orange. But the truth is, I love to go to the prison, but prison's a lot different in a third world nation than it would be like here. Many times uh, there are not guards on the inside, but just guards on the outside. And that means the meanest gang member uh, in the prison runs the prison. The rooster, if you will. Are you understanding me? And so many times when you preach, uh, they will uh, not respond without everybody looking at the meanest gang member, the guy that runs the prison. They'll look to him to see if they can give their heart to Jesus. Well, I don't like that very well. And first of all, most of them aren't there to hear me preach. See, it's unlike the prison here. You might get three meals a day, three meals maybe you don't like, but you'll get three meals. And in a country like Guatemala, they don't get any food given to them unless their family brings them food or gives them money to buy food or they have to have some kind of a... Uh, trade where they make enough money to buy their own food. So it's a lot different. So when we come in and we provide food for every prisoner, I may look stupid, but I'm not dumb. I know why they're there. They're there for the food. And they were, we were in a particular prison, and they said, don't get off the platform. It won't be safe. And I thought, well, if I'm not safe on the platform or on the floor, then I'm not safe on the platform. And I decided that I was going to try to stop the problem of everybody looking to the head gang member to see if they could respond to the gospel. I decided I'm going to go back there and I'm going to find the meanest guy in the prison and I'm going to go back and shake his hand. I went on my way back to shake his hand and I found this guy who's sitting on the back, looked kind of mad. Like some of you might be, he might be his relative today. <laughs> but I walk back and I find the guy. I could tell he ran the prison. And on the way back there, the Lord told me, give the guy a hug. I said, God, I am not giving a guy a hug in prison. <laughs> I said, God, do you know what that might mean in prison? I said, I'm not doing it. I get back there. My intention was to shake his hand. I get back there and I decide I better do what God says. I give the guy a hug. Tears begin to run down this tough man's face. When I gave the invitation that day, not one inmate had to turn and look to the gang member to see if they could come. But every person in that prison walked to the front to give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, I believe we have a debt that we must be paying. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's some good news right there. God loves you. Somebody need to hear that today. God loves you. But now, look at this next line. Who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not frustrate the grace of God. What in the world does that mean right there? Have you ever read anything in your Bible that you do not understand? If you say, oh, I understand it all, we'll cast lying demons out of you at the end of this service. <laughs> now look back at that scripture. 
I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. What does that mean? I do not frustrate the grace of God. Listen, Paul is saying there, his death and grace, they are not meaningless to me. I will tell you, when you reject and refuse the gospel, you are frustrating the grace of God. When you sit there and you know that Christ died on the cross for you and you know that his blood was shed for you and you know that he took your place on the cross of Calvary, he took your sin and you know that you're a sinner and you sit there over and over when an invitation is given, you are frustrating the grace of God. When you continue to live in sin, you're saying his grace uh, is meaningless and when you sit there and continue to live in your sin, you're saying what Jesus did on the cross, it means nothing to me. He took that brutal death for nothing. That's what you're saying. While many of us are complacent and lethargic about the things of God, there are places on this earth that people are desperate for salvation. People are dying and going to hell and what are we doing about it? There is a place of punishment, a lake of fire, the Bible says. And what are we doing about it and do we care today? In Luke 16, there's a rich man that went to hell and there's a a poor man that went to heaven. Does that mean that rich people go to hell and poor people go to heaven? Well, I know as many poor rascals as I do rich. Are you understanding me? So money does not make you go to heaven or hell. But this particular man had money. And what really sent him to hell was not his money, but when you read the story, you go through it and you see that every day there was a man that laid at his gate with sores and he walked by that man and did nothing. So I'm going to say nothing can send you to hell. Doing nothing. See, I'm a debtor. You're a debtor. But we read something here. This rich man, he did nothing. But we find something interesting about this man. Here he is in hell and he had some concern. He wasn't really worried about his money in hell. He wasn't thinking, well, I wonder what my kids are doing with the money I left behind. I wonder if the bank let my kids access my account. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I wonder if my kids split up the property the way I wanted them to. He didn't say he was concerned about his business. I bet my son is running my business into the ground now. Didn't say that. What was his concern? He said, look, I'm in this place called, uh, that is a place of torment. Could you send a missionary to my brothers? Because I don't want them to come to this place of torment. Now listen to me. He wanted a missionary to send Send a missionary to my brothers to keep them out of this place of torment. I'm here to tell you that you need to be praying for your family and be concerned about your family now. When they die, it is too late. Sometimes the news will have a tragedy and they'll say, well, let's pray for the victim. It's too late to pray for the victim. But we can pray for the families that they'll be comforted and all those kind of things. We're not uh, heartless, but I'm going to tell you, once you die absent from the body, if you're saved, you're present with the Lord. If not, you go straight to hell. There's not an offering to get you out of there. There's not a baptism that will get you to heaven. Your fate is sealed. So, this is a good week to care about your family. You are a debtor. And today, I will tell you, you and I, we cannot save anyone. The church cannot save anyone. But only God has power to save. Our job is to preach the cross and Him crucified. And when we do our part, God will do His part. Salvation is a gift. When Peter preached the word on the day of Pentecost, they said their hearts were pricked within them. 3,000 got saved that day. When uh, Jesus spoke the word to the men on the road to Emmaus, uh, they didn't understand who he was. They didn't even recognize him. But they said, do you know what happened in Jerusalem? They heard about what happened. And they're talking to the man that was the uh, incident in Jerusalem. They said, have you heard what happened? 
He begins to preach about himself from Genesis to Revelation and explains to them about the cross of Calvary and who Jesus is. And I will tell you, when he walked away, they still did not know who Jesus was, but they said our heart did burn within us when he spoke the word. When Paul spoke the word, something happened. Lydia, the wealthy woman, the Bible said, whose heart the Lord hath opened. But that's not all. Not only did she get saved, but it said her whole house was saved and baptized. I'm going to give you a word today. Some of you have family members that have been very obstinate. They have been against uh, the gospel. You have talked to them about their eternity and they bucked up against you. But I say these are the days to go back and talk to them one more time because they see what's happening in China. They see what's happening in Russia. They see what is happening with Hamas. They see what's happening with Iran and with Iraq. They see what is happening in the government of the United States of America and they do not have a hope for tomorrow to be better than today but you and I, we have a hope and we know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. So go back and speak to them again. And find that their hearts will be open. And like Lydia, not only will they get saved, but your whole house will get baptized. Hallelujah. See, there's a gospel that we're free to preach here. How many understand? We have the second, uh, well, we have the first amendment. We can have freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And if you don't like that one, we have the second one to back up the first. Whatever. We have a freedom to preach it here. We have. That's why we have so many opinions. This is a country, you can have your opinion. I don't care. You talk whatever you want, but I'm going to tell you that Jesus is the only way to get to the Father. I'm going to tell you that today that I'm going to preach the cross and Him crucified. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is still the power of God. Do we believe that here? This gospel, we are free to preach it here. But we need to remember there are those that are definitely paying a high price. Every apostle gave his life preaching this gospel. Ever, well, let me back that up. One of them committed suicide. Another one, they tried to boil him in oil, but he would not die. You ever have one of those weeks when they try to boil you in oil? That's a sermon right there, but he would not die. Man, my dad passes away, my air conditioner breaks, plumbing backs up in the house, uh, the garage door broke. I told Lori, I said, one more thing, and I'm going to have to start listening to Joel, to Joel Osteen. <laughs> but in the middle of all that, my dad dying, garage door break, air conditioner break, plumbing back up in the house. I I woke up one day and my hair was going every which way, cock-a-doodle-doo. I look in the mirror and I'm going to tell you, I woke up that day and looked in the mirror and said, today I will not die. Are you understanding me? Somebody needs to rise up today and say, today I will not die, for greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Let's talk about those other apostles, ten other ones. Then you just lay down one day and say, now I lay me down to sleep. That'd be a great way to go to heaven. They didn't go that way. You read about those other apostles. These guys are eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every one of them, if you read about them, here they are, stoned to death. Here they are. Their skin is taken off of their bones while they are living. They are shot with arrows until they die. They are hung upside down. Are you understanding me? Every one of them could have said, look, 
Before you kill me, I want to tell you I've been telling a lie for 40 years. He's not alive. He's still dead. But not one of them recanted their story because they knew they saw him die, but they know that he rose again on the third day and he lives forevermore. Paul, he said, I'm not only a debtor, but I am ready. In Ephesians, we're told to put on the whole armor of God. We're told to put on the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, loins girt about with the truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What in the world does that even mean? Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When I put my shoes on today, I said, I'm ready. When I put my shoes on, I said, I'm ready, easily available, I'm prepared, uh, it's handy, I'm happy, glad, and eager, and I'm willing. I read the book of Isaiah. I don't know what it does for you, but it does something in my heart when I read the book of Isaiah. His name means the Lord is salvation. I want to win some of the Lord every time I open up Isaiah, that he's the light of my life. When I read about uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, I realize that uh, I'm wanting to win somebody to Jesus. I'm ready. When I was born, you've heard me tell it so many times, but I, I, I got to keep telling it. I was born with a cleft palate, had a hole in the roof of my mouth. My lip did not meet in the front. The doctor said I would never talk correctly without having years of speech therapy. They said I would not hear without having some kind of hearing apparatus. But my parents did not believe the report of the doctor. They believed the report of the Lord. And at two months of age, when all Roberts was in a meeting in Mansfield, Ohio. My parents took me there and Brother Oral Roberts prayed for me, holding me in his arms. And he prayed that I would be healed. I've not had one day of speech therapy. You may not like how I talk today, but this is how a good Oki talks. You say, what about my hearing? You all know the only time I have a problem hearing is when Lori asks me to do something I don't want to do. But I knew I was healed. When I was called to preach, I was 15. But I ran from that call for the next four years. And when I finally yielded the call, I said, Mom, I'm called to preach. She said, so we were waiting for God to bring it to pass and not man. She said, we never told you, but when Oral Roberts prayed for you to be healed, you know that story. We never finished the story. We want to tell you that Oral Roberts, a big man, held you above the crowd uh, with one hand, and he said uh, uh, that this boy will preach the gospel throughout the world. He prophesied over me. It is prophecy when I'm in Pakistan. It's prophecy when I'm in Elizabeth City. It's prophecy when I preach the gospel. The Bible said you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be witnesses. I have received this power of God to change the world. And since being filled with this spirit, I'm equipped to fulfill the plan and purpose God has for my life. You too can receive that power. But see, we come to church and most of the time, instead of saying, I'm a, I'm a debtor and I'm ready, we say, man, I need something, I need something. Now, if you have a need, you came to the right place. But we ought to focus not only on what Jesus has done for us, what I need. I need a breakthrough. I need a healing. I'm under a curse. It's not that I need, but every one of us, if we came in here different, we said, I carry a breakthrough. I carry healing. I carry blessing. I carry anointing for the poor and the sick and the captive, the blind and the bruised. You've got something on the inside of you and you are a debtor and you ought to be ready to tell it. Let me close up with this. Paul ends with this. He says, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. I'm not reluctant. We read in the Bible, he said, if we're ashamed of him, Jesus Jesus said, if I'm ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of me. Jesus said, if you deny him, he will deny you. Folks, I don't know. We don't have time to pretend. We don't have time for this Sunday morning Christian. You've got to be a Christian 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the Holy Ghost. See, death by crucifixion, when that took place, it made the cross a place of suffering and shame. The followers of Christ, they were ashamed. Every disciple denied Christ. Not only Simon Peter. You know who didn't deny Christ? The women. That'll preach right there. Trying to get a better offering out of you women today. (laughs) But I'm telling you today, I'm not ashamed. He took the suffering for me. He took the shame for me. Folks, he was there naked for the world to see. They beat him. They spit on him. They mocked him. And the blood poured out for you and I. He did it all for me. And he did it for you. It's foolishness to some. We get ridiculed. We get mocked. There's opposition Politicians can try to stop it. Atheists can deny it. Agnostics can doubt it. But whatever people do to stop the gospel, it will not work. Are you with me today? It will not work. They tried to stop Paul and Barnabas from preaching to the governor. And I'm going to tell you, he said, thou child of the devil, you're going to be blind for a while. I always want to say, man, Lord, give me that. I'll just knock Washington, D.C. out. That's probably why he doesn't give it to me. (laughs) Lori and I, last year, we went to a Houston Texans game. All right, we're we're not Houston Texans fans. Lori's a a Lion fan, and I'm from that team a little north of Houston. All right, that always loses every year. All right, Mike. We went to the game. Houston Texans are playing the New Orleans Saints. And we go and we sit in a row, long row. All right, we're in two in the middle. We get there early. We're enjoying it. We're not sitting too far back. It's we're pretty much in the game. I liked it. And uh, game's getting ready to start. In on this side comes some folks. In on this side comes from some folks. On this side it was Cheech, and this side it was Chong. Some of you say, okay, listen, I, I told this story somewhere and they said, somebody said, you're a racist. I said, what do you mean? You called somebody Chong. I said, that's their name, stupid. <laughs> if you don't know who they are, look them up. They made a living telling jokes about smoking dope. So here I got Cheech on one side, Chong on the other. I mean, they have lit it up. There's no disguising it, all right? And I'm uncomfortable because here I am, you know, I'm sitting by Cheech and Chong and I'm Cracker Jack. (laughs) Whatever. Everybody okay? Come on. You know, sometimes we just need to lighten up. I made fun of myself, so get over it. But I felt uncomfortable, and I think they felt uncomfortable sitting by us. We look squeaky clean over here. You know what I'm saying? We smell like dial soap. (laughs) They smell like dope. (laughs) They're not talking to us. We're not talking to them. We're just watching the game. And I'm I'm afraid who to root for. (laughs) All right, because neither neither, uh, side of us had any... Like they didn't weren't, weren't wearing New Orleans colors or Houston colors. So about halfway through the game, I accidentally touched the guy next to me. You know, you're real close. And I said, oh, excuse me. He said, oh, no, excuse me. You know, it was, it was okay, you know. I, I, little did he know I'm already married to a guy in a prison somewhere in South America. <laughs> Some of you will catch that later, all right. Don't take anything out of context there. (laughs) Okay, anyway. He said, he said, I said, sir, who are you rooting for? He said, well, it's kind of complicated. I was born in 
New Orleans, but I live in Houston. So I still don't know if I can go, woo -hoo. You know? We get talking a little bit more. He asked me what I do. I told him what I do, and we get talking about some things, and it, it just keeps going on. He's a real nice guy. I liked him. You know, he was real relaxed. <laughs> but a little paranoid. <laughs> they evidently, they got up early to leave. He got up and he stuck his hand out to shake my hand. He said, we got to leave. Evidently, they got the munchies. <laughs> he shakes my hand. He says, let me tell you something. He said, that was a pleasure to meet you. He said, I want to tell you something. My mama's a preacher. Wow. He said, I wish I could do what you're doing. He said, don't stop doing what you're doing. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. See, some of us, we're ashamed of the gospel. When you can go to Red Lobster and sing happy birthday louder than you praise God at church, you are intimidated. Or you love cake more than you love God. But some of us have forgotten how we got saved. Some of us have forgotten how we came to the Lord. Some of us have forgotten and we need to quit holding back. I still believe uh, in what I'm preaching. I believe in the cross. I believe in the blood. I believe in this Bible. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the power of God. I still believe in revival. I still believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. I am a debtor. I am ready and I'm not ashamed. Come on, say it with me today. I am a debtor. I am ready, and I'm not ashamed. Hey, it's such an honor to have you join us for service. I pray the word was a blessing to you, and I pray you avail yourselves to the, to, to the resources we have online. And if you're ever in the Elizabeth City area, or I mean Outer Banks or Tidewater, Virginia, make the drive. Come visit us one Sunday. We would love to welcome you here, and you can experience this uh, yourself. As, as one man used to say, can't be explained, can only be experienced. There's some truth into that. Anyhow, thank you for watching. I pray the Lord will bless you and that you grow in your faith and fulfill the call that God has on your life. We here at Fountain of Life love you.